Well, good morning and happy Easter. Good morning. Glad you're here. Let's all stand. Oh, how he loves you and me. Savior Jesus Christ, and we celebrate His resurrection today. Without His resurrection, we would have no hope whatsoever. His resurrection is just as important as His life and death, because Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if He had not risen, our faith would be empty. Amen? And so I thank God for His resurrection. Go ahead and take your Bibles as we do our Sunday morning reading together in Psalms. We're going to read Psalm number 20 together this morning. Why are you turning there? Just want to remind you that after service today, there'll be no services here this evening, uh, today. Next, and none this Wednesday night, the spring break this week. So we'll have not have youth or adult Bible study Wednesday night this week. And then next Sunday morning, our Gideon representative will be here speaking to us for, about the Gideon ministry. Um, he's going to be sharing about that. We'll do a love offering for the Gideon ministry as we do every year. We didn't get to do it last year, but we'll do it uh, this year. Um, the offering plate will be on the table in front. If you want to bring an offering for the Gideon ministry, that's a great ministry. Every dime they get goes to giving out Bibles, uh, wherever they get to hand Bibles out or put Bibles. So I encourage you to be a part of that ministry next week. I will be preaching. He's not going to be preaching. He's going to be speaking about Gideon's, and I will be preaching next Sunday morning. Okay? And then uh, we've decided that while we're doing the children's ministry from 4 to 5 o'clock here at the church and having choir practice right after that, we're going to postpone our Sunday evening services until August. So no Sunday evening services up here until August, but we still will be doing our children's ministry from 4 to 5 and then choir practice right after that uh, up here on Sunday evenings. That starts next week, okay? I invite all kids to come to that too. All right, let's look to the Word of the Lord. And Psalm number 20, the assurance of God's saving work. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt off sacrifice, Selah. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation in the name of our God. We will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the King answer us when we call. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for being our blessed assurance in our salvation. We love you and we praise you this morning. We humbly bow before your presence to recognize and acknowledge you as our God and our creator and maker, O oh Lord. It is you who has made us and not we ourselves. We humbly come to praise and worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth. We're grateful for this day and what it means. Jesus, for your resurrection from the dead. Thank you for arising that morning and, Lord, defeating death, hell, and the grave. 
that we could be saved and we could have a resurrection from the dead ourselves and we can have a glorified body one day like yours. Thank you for the promise of your soon coming to receive us unto yourself, that where you are, there we may be also. Help us to worship you rightly this morning, that our minds and hearts will be upon you today, and that, Lord, as we sing these songs, we would lift our voices to you and praise and worship. Bless Danny as he leads us, Lord, and the musicians they play, that we may honor you and please you in this time of worship. And Father, I ask as I come to preach that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and empty me of myself and help me to be able to expound upon the Word of God accurately and rightly and speak through me, Father, I pray, into every heart in life. And I pray, God, if there's one here or one watching by Facebook that's lost in sin this morning, that, God, today you would get their attention, that you would awaken them in regeneration and new birth, and they would trust in you in repentance of their sins and faith in you, Jesus, to be justified and glorified one day in your presence. Have your way in this place, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's all stand. He lives. Amen. 
special guest coming up today. It's Jacob. And he got in about three minutes of practice on this, so we got it. Here we go. We got it. Here we go. Rise again. grateful that promise. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Danny, Jacob, yes. Miss Joy. We appreciate that so much this morning. Let's take our Bibles and open with me this morning to Romans, the book of Romans, <laughs> chapter number 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 34. This morning I want to preach on the topic, the greatest display of God's glory. The greatest display of God's glory. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 34. If you have your Bibles open, you're able to. Please stand with me in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. May we hear again from the word of the Lord. May he bless the reading of his word. Romans 8, 31. 
What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Please pray with me. Father, thank you today for the public reading of the Holy Scriptures. We're grateful today for this passage of the Scriptures that tells us the story of Jesus' sacrifice, his death, his resurrection, and his intercession for us, his exaltation into heaven. We pray, God, that you give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in your word. I ask that everyone, under the sound of my voice, be attentive this morning to your word with understanding and a desire in their hearts to walk in obedience to you. I pray that you would feed and nourish your people. Help me to encourage and to establish them, O Lord, in their faith in you. I pray, God, for those who are lost, that, God, today you would awaken them, God, to their sins and their condition before you and give them godly sorrow over their sins that would lead them to repentance and faith in you this morning. I pray that you would empty me of myself, fill me with your Holy Spirit, Father. Help me, O God, to be able to preach your word rightly and accurately. Speak through me, I pray, into every life and every heart and help me to articulate this message in a way that is clear and understandable. May you be exalted and may you be glorified in the preaching of your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. When we think of God's glory, we must think of it in both ways that it is revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures. His intrinsic glory and then ascribed glory. Intrinsic glory is the sum and substance of who God is. It covers all of his attributes and characteristics. Neither man nor angels can add to or take away from God's intrinsic glory. When we see a display of this glory, it is God showing himself in his many attributes. Steve Lawson writes, The purpose of God in creating mankind was simply to showcase his own greatness for his own glory. The entire universe is simply a means for God to display his own grandeur. End quote. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, we see that God talks about how he shows himself and his attributes are clearly seen even in his creation. That's his intrinsic glory. His ascribed glory is what we give to him because of his intrinsic glory. The more we get to know him, the more glory we will ascribe to him. The Hebrew word kabod translates to glory. It means something heavy or something with weight. Steve Lawson again writes, As related to God, the word glory represents the infinite weightiness of who he is. The glory of God reflects the sum and substance of his holy character. It encompasses his divine perfections, attributes, and essence. It includes his holiness, sovereignty, righteousness, omnipotence, omni omniscience, omnipresence, truth, grace, mercy, goodness, love, and wrath. It is the goodness of God. In short, the glory of God is the display of his infinite grandeur and vast greatness, end quote. There are many displays of God's glory throughout the Holy Scriptures. For example, when God spoke everything into existence and created everything, that was a display of the glory of God. When God created man out of the dust of the earth, that was a display of God's glory. When God performed the first surgery and caused Adam to go to sleep and remove the rib from man to create woman, that was a display of God's intrinsic glory. The great flood came and he delivered Noah and his family on that ark and those animals. That was the display of God's glory. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain was a display of God's glory. The, uh, the, the confusion of the languages at the Tower of Babel was a display of God's glory. Moses meeting God at the burning bush that was burned yet not consumed was a display of God's glory. The ten plagues on Egypt was a display of God's glory. God parting the Red Sea and allowing the, uh, the Israelites to cross on dry ground by, while holding back the Egyptian army with that pillar of fire uh, was a display of God's glory. And then finally removing that pillar and allowing the Egyptian army to come in there and then collapsing the Red Sea on top of them was all a display of of the glory of God. We can go on and on and on through Scripture and you can see different examples 
of God displaying who he is and displaying his glory. All of these and more were great displays of God's glory, but I submit to you this morning that the greatest display of God's glory occurred on a hillside outside the city of Jerusalem called Mount Calvary. Amen. That was the greatest display of the glory of God. God displayed his holiness and his grace. He displayed his justice and his mercy. He displayed his omnipotence and his substitutionary sacrifice. In that awful and wonderful moment in history, the glory of God was displayed in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. God displayed his hate of sin, yet he displayed his love for the sinner. When Christ went to the cross to substitute himself in our place, God's glory was on full display. I want us to examine this, this morning a powerful passage of Scripture on the total work of God in salvation and see God's greatest display of his glory in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, the first thing we're going to see this morning is God has the power to save. God has the power to save. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? These things refers back to verses 29 and verse 30. So let me read those to you. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so when Paul writes, what shall we say to these things, he's referring to those things he wrote in verse 29 and 30. Verse 29 and 30 is known as the golden chain of salvation. It shows us that salvation is a total and complete work of God himself and God alone. We can add nothing to salvation and we can take nothing from salvation. The only thing we have to offer for our salvation is our sins. And they were laid upon Christ while he was on the cross of Calvary. Notice in those two verses in verse 29 and 30 how many pronouns refer to the Father. There are nine pronouns in those two verses that refer to the Father himself. The number nine of the Bible represents the fruit of the Spirit. And as recipients of God's salvation, we are His fruit of salvation. The Father is constantly mentioned in these two verses, showing that it is all God working the work of salvation or doing the work to save us. He says in verse 29, He foreknew us. The word foreknew is translated from the Greek word, prognosko. It means to know beforehand. But in the Scriptures, this word denotes more than just mere knowledge, it also denotes a choice. God chooses. God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, as Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 very clearly says. This proves that not one Christian chose God. He chooses us. Amen? He chose us in Him before the foundation of the Lord. He does the work of salvation. Regeneration has to take place even before faith does. It happens simultaneously and quickly. You can't tell the separation of it. But regeneration must happen whereby Christ, I mean the Holy Spirit, awakens us from deadness and sin to life in Christ, gives us that new heart, and then we can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Regeneration is a work of the Lord in doing that. God chose us. The word predestined there in that verse, in verse 29, he foreknew, he also predestined. The word predestined comes from the Greek word proorizo, uh, which comes from pro, meaning before, and horizo, meaning uh, to mark off by boundaries, to determine or predetermine or foreordain. Horizo is where we get the English word horizon from. So pro, meaning before, uh, pro horizo, he predestined us, or he predetermined or foreordained us to have salvation. In this verse, it says that God predetermined before the foundation of the world that those he chose would be become conformed into the image of his son. That's what it says in verse 29. So God has chosen us for salvation to conform us into the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus, he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Not only is it God who made the choice, it is God who conforms us into the image of Jesus Christ, which is sanctification, that process in salvation. We are predestined by God the Father to be conformed to the Son's image, so there is nothing that will stop his work. He's doing the work. All the way, he does the work. John MacArthur writes, The goal of God's predestined purpose for his own is that they would be made like Jesus Christ. This is the prize of the upward call. End quote. God does this so that the Son might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
He's the most notable one, Jesus says, among those who have become brethren by me and made like him, by being born again, by being saved. Then he moves to verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Moreover is a primary particle in the Greek language that shows a continuation of a thought or an idea. So he's continuing the thought and the idea of God's work in saving us. It is all God's work. And he says in verse 30, more of whom he predestined, that's the same word he used in verse 29, these he also called. Called is from the Greek word kaleo, which means to summon or to invite. It has the idea of a subpoena. Like if you get subpoenaed to go to court, that kind of invitation, that kind of call is what it's talking about. This is the effectual calling of God, whereby God calls us to salvation by His Spirit. And we, well, every person who has that effectual call will answer that call by faith and will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an irresistible call. We can't resist that call. Why would we? Amen? It's an irresistible call. There are two calls in Scripture. There's the general call whereby God reveals himself through his creation and by writing his word, his law upon man's heart and giving every man and woman a conscience. That's general revelation of God whereby you can know there is a God. But you can't be saved by general revelation. You have to be saved by special revelation. Special revelation is this right here in these verses, the calling of God, the effectual call of God. God chose us and predestined us before the foundation of the world and at a specific time in our life, he calls us to himself through the preaching of the word of God or through the witnessing of the word of God that we might come to him by faith and be saved. Then he says, not only did he call us, he also justified. Justified comes from the Greek word diakouo, which means to show or declare to be righteous. Justification is a legal term. It's a forensic term. Because of the perfect work of Christ on the cross in our behalf, God is able to legally declare us innocent and perfect in Christ. Christ substituted himself in our place, and he took upon himself our sins and our iniquities, our guilt, and he took our punishment, and the wrath and judgment of God that we deserve was poured out on his own son, and because of that, now when we have faith in Christ, then our, his righteousness is placed on our account. Our sins have been placed on his account. We are justified. We are declared, not made righteous now, declared righteous by God. We will be made righteous when glorification happens, when we are in heaven with him. That's the last step of this chain. It says in verse 30, not only whom he also justified, he also, what? Glorified. The word glorified is from the Greek word doxeo, which means to think or render or to extend glorious. It refers to our final standing before God in our resurrected and perfected bodies, a body that's conformed into the image of Christ and freed uh, forever from the power of sin. This is when we'll be in his presence in heaven. We'll have those glorified bodies that will live forever and will never sin, never sin, think about that, in those bodies. So we see the steps of the chain, the links of the chain of salvation here, and it is God who's doing this work in us. It's because it says he, 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 God the Father is doing this work. It is he who foreknew us. It is he who chose us. It is he who uh, predestined us. It is he who calls us. It is he who justifies us. It is he who glorifies us. Also notice that every one of these verbs are written in the past tense. Did you notice that? ED is added to them, so that's past tense, right, Miss Ellen? You know what past tense means, right? It's already happened. So everyone he chose before we were ever created, every bit of this salvation was already done for us. Amen? As if it already has happened. He has already glorified us even though we're not yet glorified. Amen? He already sees us in that state. So there's absolutely nothing that can stop that from happening. Amen. Aren't you glad today, Christian, if you're one of these elect, you've been saved, you have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ, you've been called, been justified, and you're being sanctified now and made into the image of Christ, one day you will be glorified because God said you would. Rest assured in that. Amen? Amen? That's a promise of the Lord. Paul has great confidence in God and in God's sovereign decrees here. The God who began the work in the believer, he will finish that work. Listen to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul writes, Being confident in this very thing, that he, the Father, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God will complete the work of salvation he's begun in us until the end. It is God who has the right to save. It is God who has the power to save. And it is God who has the power to secure those he has chosen for his salvation. 
So verse 31, he says, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Amen? Yeah. There's no one greater than God. None whatsoever. So God has the power to save us. Now, how does he accomplish that? By the punishment of the Son, number two. The punishment of the Son. You see, our sins have to be dealt with. We can't just live however we want to live in this world and we try to be a good person. And then one day when we die, we hope our good will outweigh our bad and God will look at us and say, well, I guess you can come into heaven because your good outweighs your bad. Or you was a member of Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. You joined that church at one time in your life and your name is on the church roll. So I guess I'm going to let you into heaven. Or you was baptized one time or two times or three times in this life, you know. And, and so because you were baptized, I guess I'm going to let you into heaven. Or you had a great pet. Your parents were good people, good in society, good in their community, and they did great things. So because you're from a good family, I'm going to let you into heaven. That's not how we get there. We, our sin, personally and individually, has to be dealt with. Every one of us. Amen? And how did that happen? The Son was punished in our place. Jesus Christ went to the cross for us to pay that price for us. Look at verse 32. He, again, that's God the Father, who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? So let's break this verse down. First of all, we see the word spare. He who did not spare his own son. Now the word spare here in the Greek means to treat leniently, to refrain from, or to forego the infliction or retribution of which was designed. But the negative is added to the word where it says in verse 32, he did not spare. So when the negative did not is spare, it says God did not spare his own son. In other words, he did not treat Jesus with leniency. He wasn't lenient because it was Jesus, his own son. He treated Jesus as if it was Hitler. Or if it was Ted Bundy. Many of y'all remember who that was, right? Serial killer, famous serial killer in the United States. Or if it was Genghis Khan or Khan or whatever his name was. Amen. I'm just trying to thank some of the most evil people in the world. But you know what? He treated him just like it was me. He treated his own. He did not spare his own son. He did not take leniency on Jesus. He did not refrain from pouring out his full measure of wrath and judgment on his son. He did not forego the infliction or the retribution that was needed for our sins. Every sin that we have committed or we will commit was laid upon Jesus Christ our Savior. Thus the wrath that is required for those sins Jesus bore those for us on the cross. Wow. Every sin that we would commit in this life, Jesus took on his body on the cross. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. All of our lawlessness, all of our lawless deeds, all of our sins and iniquities was laid upon Christ and God did not spare his own son. That wrath and that judgment that we deserve. Verse 32, he took the punishment. He did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. The word delivered in the Greek is paradidomi. It comes from two words, para meaning up and didomi meaning to give. To give up together, to surrender over, to deliver over to another. As if delivering a criminal over to his punishment for his crime. That's what this word is. God surrendered Jesus over to expiatory death. He, he surrendered Jesus, his only son, over to take the punishment you and I deserve because we're the ones guilty of sin. And he suffered and died in that punishment for us. He took our place. Thank you, Lord. How would you feel if you were caught committing crimes... You went before the judge and they had your trial. You found guilty. No doubt whatsoever, you're guilty. The judge is about to pass down your sentence and someone steps up and says, Judge, I'll take her, his place or her place. What do you mean? Whatever punishment you're going to give them, give it to me. The judge says, okay, I'll do that. How would you feel about that person? Not only, will Jesus, not only does Jesus take our punishment, but listen, 
We get to walk out of the courtroom as if we had never committed the crime. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but that's good to me. <laughs> we get to walk away free. Y'all remember the old song in the hymn book, set, We've Been Set Free? He Set Me Free? Y'all know that song, He Set Me Free? We sang, That's what that talk, song's talking about. We go away from the courtroom of God as if we had never committed the crime to begin with. We go away justified, innocent, in Christ Jesus, as if, if we, as if we had never sinned. Jesus Christ was not spared. He delivered his own son up for us all. For expiatory death. Expiatory means having the power to atone for or, or offered by way of expiation or propitiation. Expiation is the act of making amends. There's some amending that needs to be made between you and God. Between me and God. We're born in this world enemies of God. We're not friends of God. We're enemies of God. We love our sins. We're lost. Amen? We're dead in trespasses and sins. We're guilty before God. And so there's some amending that needs to be taking place there between us and God. And we can't do that amending on our own. Matter of fact, we don't want to do it. If Christ had not come and God had not done this, none of us would ever want to be saved. We're content and happy just like we are. Living like we want to live. <coughs> separated from God. But thank God he didn't leave us in this position. Amen. Jesus Christ came to make amends. Propitiation is satisfaction, appeasement, or atonement. Jesus Christ went to the cross, thereby making satisfaction with God for our sins, appeasing God's wrath, his judgment, and atoning for us. That we can be forgiven. And be saved. Christ's work on the cross. Expiciated for those whom God had chosen for salvation. When it says there in, the, in our verse today. We're looking at verse 32. For us all. That's referring back to verses 29 and 30. Those whom he predestined. Those whom he foreknew. Those whom he called. Uh, those who he justified. Those he glorified. That's who it's talking about there. He delivered Christ up for us all. So the answer to that age-old question, how can God, who is just and holy and perfect and pure, who, whose eyes don't even look on sin, how can he be just and both the justifier of the guilty? How can he be both? If he's just and holy, how can he free the guilty? Being just means you have to give them what they deserve. That's justice, right? Right? Justice means we get what we deserve. You know, America don't understand what justice means anymore. Mercy means you get what you don't deserve. Or you don't get what you do deserve. Amen? Yeah. So God, His justice has been appeased. It's been satisfied. And now we can receive mercy because of Christ. He can justify us. His justice was satisfied. His wrath appeased in what Christ has done. On the cross of Calvary. Verse 32 continues. He did this. He delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The question deals with provision. Which is Christ. He is our provision. He gives us all things. God provides eternal salvation to all he has chosen. Predestined, called, justified, and glorified. By way of Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus said in John 14, 6. That he is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. He is the narrow gate and the narrow way. He is the door to heaven. There is no other way to get there but by him. He's the provision. Jesus died for everyone who would receive that atonement by faith. And listen, praise God, it's not a wasted atonement. He didn't waste his sacrifice. It's a definite atonement or definitive atonement. In other words, every person God had chosen for the foundation of the world, Jesus paid the price and every one of them will be saved. God will provide everything we need for salvation, including sanctification to fulfill the will of God for our lives in this life today. So God... The Father did not spare His own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but delivered Him up for us all. He delivered His own Son, gave Him over to our punishment, to our crimes, that His justice might be satisfied, that we might be saved. And finally, we come to the last point, the payment for the sinner in verse 33. Who 
shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. This is a prosecution question. Bringing a charge. Bring is ekaleo. kaleo. I'm sorry. Ek kaleo. It means to call in as a debt or to demand. It brings to bring to account or to make accusation against. Okay? So who's able to bring to account, into account or who's able to bring an accusation against God's elect? Because it is God who has justified us. Right? It says, it uses the word charge here. In this case, it means against. Who's able to bring a charge against God's elect? This is used in future tense, speaking of the day of judgment. When we're standing before God at judgment, who's going to be able to come before the judgment seat of, of, of Christ and condemn us, make a charge against us? On that day, who will be able to bring that prosecution to circumvent what God's already pardoned and God's already removed? Well, no one can, because why? No one's greater than God. Not one is greater than God Almighty. So when those God has justified... And those who God glorifies in heaven, there's no one able to bring a charge against what God has already done. Aren't you glad of that today? Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Who's able to bring a charge against God's elect? That word elect is eklektos. It means the select ones or the chosen ones that God has chosen. It refers again back to verses 29 and 30, those he's mentioned there. And then... Uh, it is God who justifies. We see that word again where he renders to be innocent, to deem to be right or show righteous, to declare us righteous in him. If God renders his elect to be innocent and deems them to be righteous, who can accuse them of guilt or deem them of unrighteousness? No one can because no one's greater than God. Verse 34, A, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. This is the condemnation question. Condemns is catacrino. It means to judge against, to pass sentence upon, and to damn. This is in present tense here. So this shows to bring a judgment against God's elect at any time, presently. Who's able to come at any time in our life to make accusation and condemn us to hell? Well, no one can because it says Christ is the one who died for us. Amen? Paul answers this question by the finished work of Jesus Christ, which is the payment for our sins. Verse 34a, he says, I mean verse 34b, I'm sorry, he says, it is Christ who died. This is the result of the action of verse 32. God not sparing his son, God delivering his son up. This is a result of that action. Christ died in our place. Jesus subdued himself in our place to pay our sin penalty. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. The wages means payment. The payment of sin is death. You can't escape it. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The rest of that verse says. So Jesus Christ paid the penalty of sin. He had to die. He literally physically died on the cross. The word died there is apothonesco. It means to die off or to be dead or to perish, to be destroyed. And you can read in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when Jesus was on the cross, everyone shows us that he gave up the spirit or gave up the ghost or he died. He didn't just swoon and pass out because of the pain he was in and come to in the tomb as some people believe and say. No, he literally died. How do we know? They went up to break the legs so they would die quicker. They broke the two thieves' legs who were crucified with him. When they went up to break Jesus' leg, he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. But then the Roman soldier took a spear and stuck it into the side of Jesus Christ. It went into his heart and burst his heart open, and the blood that was in the heart and the water that had formed around the heart came flowing out. No one would survive that, by the way. Can I get an agreement this morning? Amen. Amen. So yes, he literally died. And he had to literally die because we are sinners and that's the payment for our sins is death. That's right. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love toward us, you and I, and that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. He died for us. He died the death we deserved. 
so that we can live the life he requires. Think about that. God's righteous requirement is perfection. Did you know that? God's holy. He's perfect. So to be with him forever, you have to be perfect. I'm not perfect. Are you? There's not a human being living that's perfect. There's some that think they are. But I'm not perfect. I'll be honest. I am not perfect. I need Jesus. I need Jesus every day. Amen? Amen. I thank God for him every day. Because I slip up. I got banana peels all around me. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? I slip up. I don't want to slip up, but I do. I thank God for his atonement and his sacrifice. Amen? Amen. But God requires perfection. That's God's standard. And we can't meet that standard because we're not perfect. But Jesus lived a perfect life for us. In his life, he lived 33 years, Bible scholars believe. And all of those 33 years, guess what? He never sinned, not one time. Even when he was a child. You're talking about having a perfect child. Mary did. <laughs> Literally. He was perfect. He had to be perfect to satisfy God's justice in his death on the cross. So this answers the question, just how bad are my sins anyway? Fitz, just how bad are they? It cost Jesus Christ his life to pay the price for them. He had to die for my sins and for yours. Sin is serious to God, whether they're serious to man or not. Amen? They're serious to God. They cost Jesus his life. And they will cost you your eternity if you're not trusting in Christ when you die in this world. Your sins will. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. Then destruction comes. Amen? Sin will always lead to destruction. And your sins and my sins will always affect others, not just ourselves. Our choices and our decisions and our sins in this world will always affect those around us, not just ourselves. Think about that. How serious is sin to you? Christ died because of our sins. Number two, verse 34 says, and furthermore is also risen. Furthermore, death wasn't the end of Christ, hallelujah. Satan did not win, praise God. Sin did not conquer Jesus on the cross. Death is not the victor over Jesus Christ. The grave could not hold the Lord Jesus Christ. That stone rolled in front of him was not going to stay there, amen. Jesus Christ arose. Also risen, it says there in the verse, which is egrio. It means through the idea of collecting one's faculties or to awaken, to arouse from sleep or death. The Lord Jesus Christ came out of the tomb alive and glorified. The tomb is empty. And it always will be. Amen. That's why it was a borrowed tomb. He didn't need it that long. <laughs> Amen. Amen. His resurrection. His resurrection is a verification of his atoning work. It's God's stamp of approval on the work of Christ on the cross. By him raising from the dead and coming to life, God is saying, I, I accept the sacrifice for all eternity now for all those he's chosen before the foundation of the world. Nothing else has to be done. It's finished. Amen? God has accepted his sacrifice for our sin. The penalty has been paid and God's justice is forever satisfied because Christ is risen. That's what we're celebrating today. We should celebrate this every day. But we come together on Easter. You know, Easter is not like Christmas. You know why, don't you? We don't really know the day Jesus was really born. But we do know the time frame in which he was resurrected. Because it happened at the Jewish Passover. Amen? Amen. And it happened on the Sunday after the Passover. So that's how we know when this is. So that's why it moves around every year. And not on the exact same day like Christmas is. Christ is risen. Number three, verse 34 uh, D says Christ is exalted. Look at that verse again with me. Who is even at the right hand of God. 
He's exalted to the right hand of God. That's the highest position of authority of all creation. Acts 7, 55 through 56, the Bible says, being, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This is Stephen. He said, Look, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. There's no higher position in all of creation for any visible or invisible being. With that much authority. No, no, none has been exalted like Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20 through 22. Says which he worked in Christ. Whom he raised from the dead. And seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named. Not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he might put all things under his feet. And gave him to be head over all things to the church. In his exalted position. Jesus Christ has all authority of heaven and earth. He's Lord. L-O-R-D. Amen? E -N -D. He's Lord of all. And He reigns over all. He's Lord. In this exalted position, look at verse 34 at the bottom of it. What does He do? He also makes intercession for us. Make intercession comes from the word in Tukchano. It means to, to entreat in favor or against. Primarily, it means to fall in with, to meet with in order to converse and then make petition for. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father and He intercedes on our behalf. He is our advocate with the Father. Listen to the writer of Hebrews chapter 7 writes in verse 25 through 27. Therefore, He is also able to save to the uttermost. That means completely. He's able to save us completely, those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus is not like a high priest in Israel, a man who would have to make a sacrifice for his own sins because he was a sinner. Jesus didn't have to do that because he was not a sinner. He was holy and perfect and pure, so his sacrifice was for us and our sins. And he intercedes for us. So Christ, day by day, is interceding for every Christian. Every person who is saved, he's interceding on our behalf. Every moment by moment, not just day by day, but moment by moment, he is interceding for us, when Satan brings accusations and charges against us, we have our advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, to stand for us in heaven. When we sin, we have the advocate, Jesus Christ, to intercede for us. First John chapter 2, listen to this. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus Christ, in his sacrifice, and became the propitiation for our sins. He has the right and the authority now to be our advocate with the Father and our intercessor. And he is continuously interceding on our behalf as our Savior and our Lord. And do you want some good news today, brothers and sisters? If I already give you some. Jesus has never lost a case. He's never lost an argument with the devil. Amen? Amen? You know, you go to court now, you might win, you might lose. Jesus, as an advocate, never loses a case, and he never will. John MacArthur writes, There are four reasons believers can never be found guilty. Y'all hear that? And I just went through them for you. Number one, Christ died in our place. We can't be found guilty because Jesus was found guilty for us. And that satisfied God's judgment and God's wrath for us. Number two, because Jesus was resurrected, he came back to life. Amen? We can't be found guilty because Jesus defeated death, which is the end result of what? Our sins. Number three, Jesus is exalted in his position in heaven. Because he's exalted above all things in heaven and earth, no one is more powerful than him to find us guilty. And number four, his continual intercession for them. End quote. Now back to the question in this verse. Who is he who condemns? Who's able to condemn those verse 29 and 30 are talking about? Nobody. Because they would have to be greater than Christ. 
and there are none who greater than Christ. So do you understand now why the greatest display of God's glory was when Christ went to the cross? When Christ went to the cross in our place and He yielded and submitted to the Father's will completely, 100%, and He died in our place, took our punishment and our sins upon His body and the punishment for those sins, and He died the death we deserve. He was display God displays His glory in the work of Christ, in the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, and the exaltation of Christ. The greatest display of God's glory. It is there where the satisfaction was made. The sinner can now be reconciled to his creator. The criminal can now be fully pardoned and set free. The slave of Satan can now be the child of God. The poor broken vagabond can now be an heir of God. The pauper can now be a prince. The great transaction was made. Christ our Lord took for us the wrath of God giving the way for our salvation. Each time. A sinner is saved. God's glory is displayed because of the cross of Christ. Each time the lost are found, God's glory is displayed because of the cross of Christ. Each time a saint dies, a Christian dies, and goes to heaven, the glory of God is displayed because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we're going to express this truth with exuberant joy throughout all eternity. Amen? The greatest display of the glory of God was when Jesus Christ went to the cross on Calvary's hill. Are you trusting in Christ today? Are you walking in repentance of your sins? Have you got faith in Christ for salvation? How do you tell a peach tree is a peach tree? It has peaches on it. Right? The fruit. That's how you tell a Christian's a real Christian by the fruit they bear. That's how you tell one is really not because the fruit they bear. That's what Jesus says. I would encourage you to take a self-examination sometime and go through the book of 1 John. There's only five chapters. And read through the book of 1 John and see if you meet every one of those evidences. Not just some of them. All of them. All of them. You don't want to take a chance on whether you're going to make it or not. Amen? Amen. I was reading this past week some quotes, and I, I didn't write any of them down. I wasn't even going to share it today, but it's come to my mind. Some famous atheists in history, famous people who were, did not believe in God, and they spent their lives trying to hurt the church or the cause of Christ, but on their deathbed when they were dying, they began to confess that God was real. Wow. Not in repentance and being saved, but in fright and fear of what they was about to face. Wow. They were no longer courageous anymore to stand up and curse God. Now they were frightful. Because they finna face something that's unknown. Amen? Amen. And every one of us is going to face that. One day. <laughs> Jesus tarries is coming. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. That's the next step after death, is the judgment. If you die in this world without Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's no hope for you whatsoever anymore. There's no place to go for people to pray you into heaven. That don't, that's not biblical. It's not scriptural. It can't happen. Jesus is the only way to heaven. You must individually yourself, repent of your sins and trust in Christ and Him alone for salvation. Someone else can't do it for you. Amen? Amen? I had a man tell me one time years ago, his wife was a faithful member of the church. She loved the Lord. She was there. She served in church. Her husband never did come with her. I go visit him. I talk with him. I try to share the gospel. This is what he says. He says, well, my wife goes enough for both of us. Yeah. Really? That's what you're going to tell God one day. When God put His own Son on the cross for you, and He bled and died, and God did not spare His own Son, and you're going to look at Him and say, well, my wife went enough for us? That's arrogant, isn't it? I'm telling you, you better get on your face before a holy God and righteous God, and you better be broken over your sins, and you need to repent and trust in Christ and Christ alone 
and be saved. Amen? Amen? Or you will burn forever in hell. And I'm not saying that to be ugly. I'm just being truthful because I love you. And I want you to go to heaven. I want you to know the truth. I can't make you go and I can't give it to you, but I can tell you how to get it. Amen? That's why we're in this church this morning. We're celebrating what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary and His resurrection so that we could have eternal life. Not so we could just live like however we want to live and then try to get a ticket, a free ticket to heaven one day. There needs to be some changes shown in your life. If you're truly born again, you are going to have some changes in your life. You're not going to continue to walk in your sins and walk in your flesh. You're going to be walking for Jesus and living for Jesus. Amen? And you're going to love him. That's part of the criteria in 1 John. And to love him, Jesus said, you will keep his commandments. You will obey him. You will walk with him. And I'm saying this today because I love you. And I want you to know if you know, if you know, that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord. Because you don't ever know when death's going to knock on your heart's door. Today's the day of salvation, the Bible says. Now is the accepted time to come. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near, the Bible says. If the Holy Spirit of God is drawing your heart, why wait? Turn to him now while he's drawing you. Surrender to your, your heart to Christ and be saved. Be changed. Be born again and follow the Lord. Amen? Amen. I believe we're living in the last days and I believe time is getting closer and closer for us. You can just look around you in this world and see how things are going. And I've got to share the truth with you. But I'm going to give an account to God one day. I've got to stand before God myself. And I've got to give an answer and account to Him for my calling. And if I don't tell you the truth and preach the gospel to you, He's going to hold me accountable for that. And I'm more worried about what He says than what you think. Amen? Amen? I love you, and I want you to go to heaven, but you've got to know how to get there. Amen? If you don't know how to get somewhere, you've got to get directions. <laughs> Women know that. Men have a hard time with that. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we've had together this morning. I do pray for every individual who is here, those who are watching on Facebook, God, that our hearts be right with you, that we would know you, follow you, and live for you every day, Jesus. We're thankful for what you did for us, Father. You delivered your only son up to go to the cross. He died in our place to pay our sin debt, to satisfy your justice. Thank you, Lord, for not sparing him, not being lenient toward him, but letting him do the full work so that we could be saved completely and fully. Thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection from the dead, your exaltation into heaven, being our intercessor with the Father, and the promise of your soon coming. Have your way in every heart and every life, I pray. Lord, I pray people would turn to you and trust in you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's all stand.